Next up, we're going to continue. I was going to move on, but we've got one more doctor, uh, Dr. Robert Jackson. If you're here, oh, he was behind the screen too. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your willingness to have me here as your guest. I'm from the upstate, from Spartanburg. I've practiced family medicine for 40 years, 38 years as an independent physician, and two years working for Spartanburg Regional Medical Center. I attended Clemson University, Medical University in Charleston, three years as a family medicine resident in Spartanburg, and one year as a surgery resident there also. I'm here to advocate for doctors in the state of South Carolina. I think it's a little bit odd that I have to advocate for physicians. But that's what I'm here to do. In the 1840s, in Vienna, there was a physician named Ignatz Simmelweis who worked at a teaching hospital, the alleged mine Krakenhaus. He was a young obstetrician from Hungary. His responsibility was to watch out and take care of postpartum female patients. The protocol in that day was for the attending physicians to perform autopsies on the patients who had died the previous night. And then they would take their students in tow, go to the postpartum ward, and examine all of the postpartum females on Dr. Simmelweis' ward. He noticed that the female patients who were not examined by the attending physicians did not acquire puerperal fever, childbed fever. Being an astute and observant young physician, he decided to institute a policy whereby the attending physicians would wash their hands before examining his patients. He deduced that there must be something that was being transmitted from the morgue to his patients. The older physicians held him up to scorn and ridicule and did not want to wash their hands, but it was his ward. He prevailed. They had to wash their hands, and the 40% mortality on his ward plummeted. He then perceived that there was something being transmitted from patient to patient because the infections continued, and he instituted a policy of washing hands in between patients. The older physicians violently objected, went to the hospital administrators protesting this young physician's policy, and they prevailed. The hand washing was discontinued. The mortality went back to 40%. Young Dr. Semmelweis resigned in humiliation. He went to Czechoslovakia to a hospital in Krakow, instituted the same policy, obtained the same results. The same ridicule and scorn was heaped upon him by older physicians, and the same result. He ended up resigning. He died in an insane asylum because he could not escape the vision of his patients dying needlessly from infections. Less than 50 years later, Hand-washing in between patients became the standard of care. The truth is often ridiculed and scorned. It's then violently opposed, and then it becomes self-evident. And in medicine, it becomes the standard of care. Medicine advances due to observations of individual physicians and innovations of astute physicians who are willing to practice medicine and willing to try new techniques or new medications or new modalities, willing sometimes to go against the established order or tradition 
or existing protocols often enduring ridicule, scorn, or ostracism. However, the truth, like the tar baby, is a sticky thing, and it's persistent. More than that, suppressing truth is like trying to hold a beach ball underwater. <laughs> it's exhausting and nearly impossible. It eventually comes to the surface. The truth, when first prevented, is almost always ridiculed. It's then violently opposed, but then it eventually becomes self-evident. And like I said, in the medical world, it then becomes the standard of care. Those physicians who want to be innovative and want to provide quality care for their patients by prescribing a safe and effective medication, such as the one we've discussed today, which is ivermectin, are not only being ridiculed, but are being violently opposed. And many of them are being threatened with the loss of their livelihood. Many who would like to be here today feel so threatened they are fearful to make an appearance. These things should not be in America, the home of the free, the land of the brave. Here's my concern. Physicians in South Carolina are being strong-armed by hospital system employers, insisting that they adhere to protocols for the treatment of COVID and not allowing them to innovate or try new medications. COVID has only been an issue for two years. Every treatment is new and untested. We should be trying all manner of medications, even repurposing old medications like hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, as are our medical peers all around the world. Senator Hutto has left us, but I want him to understand that I am one of those doctors that he wants to hear from who has been instructed by his employer to not prescribe ivermectin. Two weeks ago, I was informed by the hospital system at Spartanburg Regional that I was one of the highest prescribers of ivermectin in the hospital system and that I should cease and decease, desist. There was a veiled threat that if I continued to prescribe ivermectin, that my employment there would end. There was nothing put in writing, but that message came to me through my office administrator. I want you to understand that the physician-patient relationship is a sacred relationship to me, and that when there is informed consent, and patients understand the risk and benefit of a proposed prescription or medical treatment regimen, that I believe that hospital entities, insurance companies, or federal entities should not interfere in that doctor-patient relationship. I am a free American, and I'm not going to be bullied or intimidated by hospitals or insurance companies or federal entities. I have personal friends in the hospital, and I want you to understand that when I practice medicine for 40 years, that my patients become my friends. They become like family. And they're in the hospital seriously ill with COVID, on ventilators, and their families are begging intensive care doctors to try ivermectin to treat their patients. My patients are not illiterate. They're on the internet every day, and they understand the benefit of ivermectin for patients that are being treated around the world with that very same modality, only to hear these ICU doctors look at them and say, that's not a part of our protocol. And these patients are saying, but everything you're using is not helping. My husband, my wife is dying. What's the harm? Why will you not even try it? It's safe. It's effective, it's inexpensive, it's not going to hurt my husband or wife, it can only help. And their only response is, it's not part of our protocol. As to the effectiveness of ivermectin, I would only share with you what Dr. Pierre Corey shared with you, the example of Uttar Pradesh, also in Peru. Peru had an epidemic just like everyone else in the world, their administration decided to distribute ivermectin nationwide 
and their pandemic disappeared entirely, almost to zero in Peru. A different administration came to power. They discontinued the ivermectin distribution and their epidemic returned to the same as all of their neighboring nations. The administration realized their mistake, began to distribute ivermectin nationwide, and their pandemic disappeared once again. The same thing happened in Mexico City. Their hospitals were at, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Capacity. And within three months, their hospitals were down to 20 to 30 percent utilization, all because they were distributing ivermectin nation, uh, citywide in all of Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world. I brought for you copies of these meta-analyses of uh, ivermectin use around the world, randomized control studies. You gentlemen and lady can look these over yourselves, and I would encourage you to do so. And the, Senator Hutto asked, what would we like for you to do? Here's my suggestions. Number one, a magistrate once told me that no matter how thin you slice the piece of bread, there's always two sides to the story. You're going to have to do your own research. You're going to have to do your own investigation and come to your own conclusion. But be careful that you don't associate with the crowd that will have egg on its face when that beach ball of truth comes to the surface and we find that ivermectin is safe and effective and it works well in treating our patients. And it becomes like hand washing the standard of care. I would ask you to advocate for the sanctity of the physician-patient relationship and the right of patients to practice medicine unimpeded by the bureaucracy. And just so you'll know, I have had pharmacists call and question my judgment when I have prescribed ivermectin and refused to prescribe the medication, saying that their pharmacy did not approve of it. If I were king for a day, I would recommend that we prescribe ivermectin to all adults in the state of South Carolina just like they did in Uttar Pradesh and in Peru and in Argentina and Mexico City. I think we would see COVID disappear in South Carolina. And we could be the first in something in the United States rather than last. Remember, the next very ill patient in the ICU could be your spouse, your parent, or your child. And when everything else fails, you could be the one looking at the ICU intensivist and saying, well, doctor, everything else you've tried has not worked. Why will you not try ivermectin? And he'll look at you and just say, well, it's not on our protocol. Thank you for your kind attention. Dr. Jackson, I appreciate you being here today, and I also want to thank you um, just on your advocacy for the lives of children as well. I appreciate that. Um, I know the senator from Orangeburg is, he's not on the subcommittee, but he's on the full committee, and he's, he told me before the meeting he was going to have to be in and out, so he's probably listening somewhere. But I'm glad that we have someone like you who is telling us they have been threatened or coerced to stop their kind of treatment. I think that's what our committee is wanting to get at. It's like I said before when I opened up the meeting, you know, we're not here to debate masks and vaccines and things like that. We're here to get, once all the, the measures that are put in place to maybe reduce symptoms or try to, to get some level of prevention in place, we're here to talk about what happens to these people once they catch it, whether they're vaccinated or not what kind of treatments are available to save, to save them. I do have a question for you. We've heard about the ventilator, and we've heard that once something gets to the, to the ventilator stage, and again, I'm an engineer, I'm not a doctor, or is there harm being done by putting someone with COVID on a ventilator, or is maybe that's not a fair question to ask? There's probably many well, steps. I'm, I'm not an intensivist, but what I've read is that the last resort is putting folks on it on a ventilator. You try to avoid that as long as possible. But in some patients, it's going to be inevitable. There, 
their pulmonary status, the inflammation in their lungs is such that they're, uh, they're going to end up on a ventilator. And in your opinion, would, would you believe, when, when do you think the best time to use the therapeutic that you just mentioned? Is it right when symptoms start or is it where someone feels like, you know, I have heard, I've heard people that have been tested positive with COVID, they've gotten a headache, they laid on the couch, they never really knew anything was wrong and they, they were back to normal in a couple of days. How, how, how do you know when the therapeutics are right for, the, for that person? Let's see, you can't predict who's going to progress to becoming very ill. And my recommendation, and not just mine, but a lot of the folks that are much more uh, competent and treated a lot more patients than I have, their recommendation is to treat everybody early so that nobody progresses to severe illness. Ivermectin is so inexpensive. I mean, it's 60 cents to a dollar a pill. Uh, why not treat everybody early and not allow anybody to progress to severe illness? That, to me, is wise. And, and I believe we heard testimony today that Ivermectin, did it receive a Nobel Prize or an award in 2015? The founder of the, of the chemical, the product. The founder. He, yeah. he, he received a Nobel Prize, yes, sir. And how long has this been used in humans? It's been used for 40 years. It and came on the market initially for treating uh, river blindness, onychocerciasis. But is there any, like, across a wide range, are there any things to look for to where it might be to where you wouldn't want to use that in somebody, or is it so proven and trusted over four decades that it's not a problem? Annually, there's one death per year treated, uh, attributed to ivermectin. By comparison, there's like 500 deaths per year attributed to Tylenol. Okay? That's okay. how safe ivermectin is. And I think most people, including myself, if somebody told me to take Tylenol, I wouldn't think twice. Nobody thinks would, twice about take taking that. Tylenol. Okay. I may have another question for you, but I know the senator from Buford has a question. Thank yes, you, Dr. Chuck. And then we've got I, others. Th thank you, and, and, and thank you for the example you gave us up front about the hand washing and, and going against accepted practice, and then over time um, it becomes the new standard of practice. Yes, and, sir. And you're, you're talking about in terms of – things that inhibit or constrain the physician-patient relationship. And, and one of those constraints I think you've identified is a physician's employer may, may, may suggest or state that if you engage in this particular form of treatment that your employment may be jeopardized. And that certainly is a constraint and a deterrence. Um, I want to ask you about what another constraint might be. Um, would a physician be constrained or reluctant to prescribe therapeutics to a patient because the prevailing standard of care as articulated by the CDC or by whomever doesn't support that that particular prescription in other words would a physician be afraid of malpractice or be afraid of um, an allegation that they didn't follow an accepted standard of care is, is that a constraint on what a physician now uh, in determining what to prescribe to a patient. Is that a factor that, that enters into the equation? Well, medical associations issue guidelines for treatment of all manner of things like diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and all physicians pay attention to those guidelines. But that's all they are is guidelines. And for various extenuating circumstances, in any individual patient, you can't always follow the guidelines. A patient may be impoverished. They cannot afford the medication. They may be low IQ. They can't understand the regimen. Uh, they may be just defiant and unwilling to take any medication. So guidelines are just guidelines. The standard of care is always uh, a guideline itself. And for whatever reason, you may not be able to follow the guideline or the standard of care. Um, but again, physicians deviate from the standard of care or from the guidelines for various reasons all the time. And I guess that's, that's the reason for my inquiry here, because I'm trying to decide what an appropriate public policy response by this General Assembly might be. Right. And I'm, I'm just wondering out loud if, for lack of a better phrase, a safe harbor were created in regard to the context of COVID-19 and for a limited period of time and recognizing that standards of care in regard to treating that virus are evolving as, as evidence-based things come back and forth. 
Would you view that as an appropriate public policy response uh, by the General Assembly to recognize that this is an area where the standard of care is, is of necessity fluid because we're dealing with something new, and, and that an appropriate public policy response by us might be to give physicians a degree of comfort or assurance in regard to them exercising his or her best judgment? It, it, would, would that be something that this General Assembly could do? I would, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator from Buford. Senator from Ritz and Senator McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Doctor, for your, for your comments. My question uh, and, and concern are pretty similar to what um, Senator Davis just asked about the standard of care, but I wanted to go a little deeper because in listening to your testimony and the testimony of the doctor, I believe from Lawrence, who came before you, and the testimony of the two doctors who are not uh, here in South Carolina, all talking about the efficacy of ivermectin. Um, as a layperson, can you explain to me why you guys are so in the minority in your uh, position on on that on that treatment option? Um, well, I, I would submit to you that we're not really in a minority. You can't get ivermectin hardly anywhere in the United States because there's so many physicians prescribing it, so many patients demanding it. It's just hard to get ivermectin. There are a lot of doctors prescribing it, and we're not really in a minority. Okay, but when I think about the standard of care as a layperson, not a public health right. expert, standards not of care medical. take a long time to evolve. This has only been happening for less than two years in the United States. Right. Protocols I take time to establish, standards of care, and, and you know, they keep hearkening back to uh, control trials, randomized control trials, all those sorts of things. They also take a long time for large studies to emerge. Right. I get that. But isn't that exactly what we want? When yes, ma'am, we do. But listen, people are dying every day for the lack of effective treatment. And well, if you wait on all of those things to come available, I'm looking in the face of people who are very ill and very sick and people that I don't want to become very ill and very sick. And I've looked at real world data from India and South America and Mexico and other parts of the world where they have practically eradicated uh, COVID. And I'm saying, look, I know something that'll work for you. And they know it too. They've read the data. They've looked at it. They're not ignorant. And they're coming to me and say, doctor, why don't you prescribe ivermectin for my mama? And I'm saying, I don't know why I shouldn't prescribe ivermectin for your mama. Okay, so you're saying that your hospital is stopping you, preventing you from, from doing that. Well, they're that. trying to, but, but I still prescribe it, okay. and I may not have a job much longer. Okay. Um, of course, that you know, that's your prerogative. And they but, should stick to administration, and they should allow me to stick to treating patients. Yeah, I, I'm glad you made that point, because what I was about to ask you is, it, this seems to be patient driven and you described people like me who are lay people who read, um, I read as much uh, scientific data and medical um, data from medical professionals as I can get my hands on. This is a new virus, but certainly, you know, the standard of care that has worked in other states uh, and, and possibly other countries doesn't seem to uh, doesn't seem to be around ivermectin. It, it it seems that we are at least what I'm hearing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that we are talking about patients who are driving their own treatment options based on what they've read, not based on scientific evidence. And there, there seems to be from the testimony that I've heard here today just so far that doctors who are insisting on this 
specific treatment option are willing to throw the standard of care out the window because ivermectin is supposedly a safe drug that has been effective on to treat other issues. Uh, as you said, COVID-19 is new. So it, it, why it, it, not go through the proper protocols and procedures to make sure that we are not compromising patient safety as it relates to this particular drug. In February, the National Institute of Health said they could not recommend for or against ivermectin until there were additional studies available. Since that time, there have been four quality randomized control studies justifying and validating the use of ivermectin for the treatment of COVID-19. And I'm just saying to you that there's plenty of good evidence justifying the use of a safe, effective, inexpensive medication that does absolutely no harm. Absolutely no harm. It's not going to hurt my patients for me to give them ivermectin. It's not going to hurt their pocketbook, and it might save their life. So why does anybody care? Why does anybody protest? What does the hospital care if I give my patients ivermectin? What does the federal government care if I give my patients ivermectin? It's neither here nor there to them. Just because it's an off-label use, let them stay out of the life of me and my patients. They shouldn't give two hoots and a holler if I give ivermectin to my patients. It's not going to hurt them, and it might just save their life, ma'am. I hear you. But Please hear I, me. I, Please hear me. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to Please understand. Please understand that we don't wait on protocols. We don't wait on standards of care when we're in the field treating patients in my office. The protocol and the standard of care is not a sacred cow. Do you understand that? It's not a sacred cow. I'm not suggesting that it is. A it sounds cow. like you are. Well, I'm not. I'm telling okay. you I'm not. Well, I beg your forgiveness, but it does sound that way. Okay. What I am suggesting, though, is there's a reason that, obviously, you are not in private practice. You are I am in private with practice. A, okay. Well, you're affiliated with a hospital that you say yeah. is tying your hands and not allowing you to provide the treatment that you would like to provide. But I am not convinced that the studies, the four clinical trials or whatever you've just referenced is enough. Like you are, it sounds like you are, single-handedly um, speaking for uh, the, the entire medical profession about the efficacy of ivermectin, and I don't think that you have the ability or, or the authority to do that. So I'm glad that you have a hospital that is overseeing um, doctors like you who, you know, may want to go against scientific medical research or not wait for the for the results of, of the uh, medical research that you, you would need to treat If you can't get ivermectin anywhere in the country, Somebody else is prescribing it besides me, and they all believe the same thing that I believe. Okay. Does that make my point? No. Okay. Well, you and I disagree. That's great. We Thank you, Dr. Allen. I, I believe what you're trying to say is if you were in the minority and it was just Dr. Jackson that believed in a 40-year-old drug that's out here, there should be ivermectin slammed on the shelves, walking in, anywhere grabbing it. But if a lot of your colleagues across the nation are writing prescription after prescription, it's kind of like when, when you have a shortage of fuel and people are lined up to get fuel. If nobody needs fuel or nobody's wanting fuel, then the pumps will be, still be full. But the ivermectin is off the shelves or behind the shelves because many doctors like yourself across the country, are you, are you stating that to this committee that many doctors across the country are prescribing this Medicine. I'm, I'm not the only doctor prescribing ivermectin. I'm not the only one who believes in its safety and effectiveness. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Senator from Compton, Senator Margie Brock Matthews. Just one question. Um, do you know of any instances where people have had COVID and were treated with ivermectin but have also died? No, ma'am, I do not. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator from Lawrence, Senator Verdon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Jackson, uh, so Dr. Hagen Boo gave her uh, statistical data on her caseload and her hospitalization rate and her death rate. You have your, uh, can you share anything with I, us? I don't have exact numbers, but I, I can say to you that the folks that I have treated with hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, none of them had to go to the hospital for admission or ended up in the ICU, uh, except for one. But she came to me very late. She had already been sick for two and a half weeks, and I was already behind the eight ball when she showed up. Well, thank you, Doc. And I, I really appreciate you taking time to be here. Uh, when I see you and um, think of your um, generation of the practice of medicine, I think of uh, numerous family members in my family. Um, you and Dr. Hagenboo, uh, she described herself as a dying breed. Mm -hmm. um, and I, no one's given to hyperbole more than myself. But did you know they had to rewrite the news coverage? They had to retype it just a few seconds ago of your presentation here. As soon as you came out with hoot and holler to make a point, uh, it, it transcended uh, the king for the day. Oh, it did? I know that you don't truly aspire to be king for a day. <laughs> I know that you don't want to put the jack in my jaw and pour that ivermectin down my throat. But you know what? That's what's going to be presented tomorrow for your testimony for public consumption. Well, I'm I, glad. I regret that but because all of us understand where you're coming from. I admire and I appreciate your passion. And I thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And I want to follow up real quick before Senator from Greenville. When I heard that, I thought I was telling um, one of my neighbors was just like a grandpa. He was my best friend's grandpa. And he would tell us all the time, I don't give two hoots and a holler what you think. So I went back to my childhood <laughs> days when you spoke that, and I was like, so anyway, I, I, I appreciated hearing that terminology. Thank you. Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin. Before you go, Doctor, I did just want to thank you for coming and testifying. You are an extremely brave individual. I, I know in my heart there are probably hundreds or, or thousands of doctors in South Carolina that are in your shoes that believe in it um, or at least want to try it because they truly care for their patients and they're just afraid to come forward for fear of losing their jobs. And I get that. Maybe they're young, they're married, got family and a home mortgage and a car payment. I get that. But maybe by you coming forward, um, others will brave up, for lack of a better word, and come forward too. Thank you. Margie, did you have one more? No. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Edward Simmer from DHEC.